here. We're at our limits, says Vanessa. Yes, we are here. We're at our limits. And uh, maybe interesting things happen at the limits. I'm just going to jump in since we're having a late start. And uh, I just want to say what a time to be doing this class. The theme of it was actually planned um, six months ago. And little did I know how it would coincide with the events where many have, many have died, many are grieving, many are struggling uh, with livelihoods and illness. Uh, and yet, for many, this, I just want to say this is a daily reality for many who live under conditions of war and hunger and lack of resources. And yet the pandemic um, creates a shared experience. We are all impacted. And uh, when preparing for this class, um, uh, I thought a pandemic might help us. It might, we might be helped by heeding the advice of ancient Greek philosophers. I don't know if you know this story, but there's an old story that when Plato was dying, he was on his deathbed. And his, a friend of his said, hey, would you sum up your life's work? And he could barely speak and he just said, practice dying. What does that mean to practice dying? Um, meant the philosophers of those times and also different philosophies, different religions all speak about separating the soul from the body. Um, many different philosophies, spiritual views, religious views speak of life after death, um, that there's something beyond our physical bodies. And for many of us, this gives us a great deal of comfort, especially during times of loss. Um, process work also brings different tools and different perspectives um, to help us with states of dying, altered states of consciousness, um, death and grief. And I hope to go through some of those with you today. Um, I just, we kind of wasted time trying to get me back online, but if you might consider, if you wanna do this at some point during our lecture, you might sit back and do a little inner work and just close your eyes and relax and think well, if this was the end of your life, if you do imagine no work, no effort, uh, none of your social roles, no more doing, if you totally allow yourself to drop out and give yourself that openness, um, what would still remain? What is there? And if you, if you do that during our time together in the class and you wanna share that in the chat, um, Feel free to do that. I think it's important when working with people and just living life that we explore what people's deepest views are about death. People don't talk about it enough. And I think as practitioners, those of us who work with people are sometimes shy to ask. And I know that sometimes in our most quiet places, all of us ponder death. We even ponder it as young children, and everyone has their own viewpoint. And when working with people around death, um, if you don't know them, obviously it's fun, it's interesting, it's deep to drop into states of leaving life and exploring emptiness inside, exploring not knowing and seeing what emerges. Something like that short exercise that I just mentioned. For folks who have religious beliefs, um, going more deeply into those experiences is so important. Can we, for example, can we access Jesus? Can we feel him? Can we hear his voice? All of these things are deep experiences. Or if your belief is that you go out into the cosmos, that you become a star, these are so important. Death is so taboo for most cultures. Um, for many cultures, it's more a way of life. And you might consider also encouraging families to discuss death. And uh, I enjoy also speaking about death 
even with children. Oh, someone, Rio says, gratitude is what remains for her. Thanks for sharing that, Rio. Yes, if you would die, gratitude would be there. Sweet. But so I wanted to say that uh, if you bring the concept of that into your family or children, um, interesting things happen. And with that said, I'm going to share something with you from my own personal life. Um, it's actually a little piece from my website. A while back, I did a one-woman show called Mama Speak. And this is the voice. I'm going to share my screen with you. And this is how some children might express death if they were invited in a certain way. Oops. I think I'm good. Okay, folks. Here we go. Mama. That's a child, a child's view of death. One day when I'm dead, I hope my son finds that tape and remembers himself and remembers that I'm gonna get too big and I won't fit in the house anymore when I'm 100 years old. I'll be a spirit who flies around and comes visiting him. That's a four-year-old dreaming brain. So I wanna support that viewpoint of bringing death more into everyday life. And, you know, uh, uh, one of my books, Raising Parents, Raising Kids, I speak about death. And I went to talk at a preschool just about kids and stuff. And a teacher said, you know, I read your book and I have to share this experience with you. There were two kids in the preschool. These are three and four year olds, two kids. And they lied down, they lied down on the floor and they said they were dead. And she said, normally I would say to them, oh, you're so silly, come on, get up, let's play. But instead, since she had read my book, she said, oh, I guess we're all dying today. And then suddenly, if you can imagine this, an entire class of preschoolers laid down dead and everyone was quiet. You know how rare that is with three and four year olds? Everyone was totally quiet and resting. It was an amazing moment, she said, to just relax and rest together in silence. And then, of course, they all got up again at some point and played around. So hopefully just inspiring us to bring in uh, death more as a way of life. If we do practice dying, or many of us might work with our fear of death or dreams of death. Um, here are some structural processes that you might consider that are in the background of that. Um, for example, some parts need to die and others need to come to life. Some of us need death as a challenge. Some of us need to fight to live. Whoops, someone has music in the background? Nice to hear. Um, some of us need to die, so to speak, metaphorically, to make big life changes. Knowing that we can't live forever motivates us actually to go over big edges in life. Some of us need death in order to drop out of something specific, whether that be a job or a relationship or a behavior. And some of us need to die in order to complete something that we otherwise can't complete. We go into a state of mind of dying and in that altered state, we were able to do something that previously we couldn't do. 
And interestingly enough, those of us who have had family members or close friends who have died, and we felt that they maybe died at central life edges, or there were things that they couldn't do in this life, when they were able, uh, you can never prove this, of course. If a family member, someone who's died, you can never prove, did they complete something when they were dead? We don't know. But somehow we do know in a different part of ourselves that can sense things, that can feel those who've died. Um, and many people, I can't tell you how many people I've worked with, how many people I have known who've said to me, yeah, I had such a terrible critical father, but now he's not critical anymore. I feel he made a development. He's actually supportive to me. I feel him on my left shoulder here. Somehow, at least to the living, it appears that the dead also develop. And that's also one of the structural process around death. Another thing that you might consider is, is uh, getting in touch with the energy of the so-called killer, uh, the illness, God, whoever it is that's creating death. Finding that energy, connecting with it, and somehow using it. And a final thing that is more philosoph philosophical that we might consider is that dying perhaps compensates a collective attitude that emphasizes life. I just want to name that. Um, how to follow the process of death, dying, and grief. Many people know of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She was a pioneer in the field of death and dying, and she outlined different stages of grief that people find useful. Uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I think her contributions were so helpful because it helped to accept and normalize the different emotional experiences that people have. Um, from a process work perspective, you can see all of those experiences happening. However, as a program, I think it's, it's less effective. Best is to follow what emerges. Yes, there might be anger, there might be bargaining, there might be something who knows what might be but the ability to follow a person's experience and unfolding the dreaming would be our goal. Um, also, I want to say that with death, there are often experiences and grief, there are often experiences that people have that are very taboo and very marginal. Some people actually feel joy. Some people feel like celebrating, especially if someone has uh, died who has really been abusive to you. I've seen that happen with, with kids whose abusive parents have died and everyone is angry at them because they're not grieving properly when actually they're happy. Something to consider. But the process of following is so important. Um, last month, uh, many of us, uh, especially those of us who are basketball fans like me, learned of the death of Kobe Bryant. He's a big U.S. basketball star, but actually he was famous internationally, and I know a lot of people know him. And he and his daughter passed in a, they died in a helicopter crash along with a bunch of other people. And there was uh, Deepak Chopra was on CNN television, and uh, uh, he was, they were talking about uh, the death of Kobe Bryant. And the news anchor, Don Lemon, from CNN asked Deepak, he said, hey, shouldn't we be using meditation now to calm ourselves? Because Deepak also apparently was a meditation instructor for Kobe Bryant. So Don Lemon says, shouldn't we meditate now? Shouldn't we calm ourselves? And Deepak adamantly said, no. Now we need time to grieve. We're upset, we're heartbroken, we're grieving. In other words, following what is happening. Um, process work offers a really special set of skills that allows us to work with people who are dying, who are in coma and altered states. I want to uh, draw our attention to a few books. Uh, Arnie Mandel's seminal book about coma, Key to Awakening. Amy Mandel's book, Coma, A Healing Journey, is a fabulous illustrated workbook if you are working with a loved one, if you're with a loved one who's dying or who's in a far out uh, comatose state, really great exercises. I also want to acknowledge um, 
Stan, Tamandel, and, and Ann Jacob. Are you, I think you guys are here. I saw Ann. You guys are here. Hi. And uh, they've also written a book about working with Alzheimer's, and they do a lot of workshops around that. And um, finally, um, uh, uh, also Nisha Zenoff. I don't know if she's here. Um, Nisha Zenoff has written a, a wonderful book, uh, The Unspeakable Loss, which is about grief and dealing particularly with uh, the death of losing a child, which is really powerful. Um, so these are some sources for you that uh, from a more process work perspective, but the, the skills to work with people who are dying, it's hard to show and teach these hands-on techniques online, but let me give you an example of a young man um, who I worked with some years back who was dying of AIDS. Um, James was unable to speak and he was in and out of consciousness and uh, his family felt that he was unreachable. So the first thing I did is I got really close to him and I whispered in his ear, I said, I'm here and I'm here and I believe in you and I'm here to follow your deepest experiences. And I was just with him. And then I noticed his right hand moving. And I said, hello, hand. I'm glad you're with us. Go ahead and feel free to move your hand in whatever way is right for you. And he began, he slid his hand down to the right side of his hip like this. I'm going to show you. You have to imagine him lying down. And he was like this. And at the same time, he was making a sound. So just dreaming into what that could be and looking at that hand, I thought he's getting his keys. He's reaching for his keys in his right pocket. So I said to him, I said, you can find the keys. And suddenly his hand relaxed. I said, that's right, grab those keys, James. And just symbolic thinking, I was thinking, well, you use keys to open the door of your house. And I also know that uh, when people are dying, they're often trying to go home in a more uh, transpersonal sense of what that means. So I said to him at that point, yeah, you got the keys, James. You can go home now. Go for it. Open the door. And at that point, he, he became relaxed and way less agitated. And he looked at me with great big eyes and it's one of the more touching encounters I've had with people over the years. And he swung his arm around my neck. I was the other way. And he pulled my head and my body onto his chest, to his heart. It was the most touching thing. I said, yes, that's the key how you pull me close. The key is love and connection. I can feel your love. Welcome home. He got a big tear coming down his face. And at that moment, I just stayed with him what seemed like eternity. Um, and I think for the, that was what he, my work with him over years had a lot to do with love and finding his deepest sense of home and acceptance in the world, particularly as a gay man in the 80s and the 90s. So it was very, very touching. So many of us know, and I know so many of you actually also have worked with people and connected with people who are dying and have had some of your deepest experiences. And I don't know if you wanna indicate that in some way by by chatting that, if you can feel me somehow, or just waving your hand or, or something. But I, I, yes, I've seen you guys. I know that. It's really, really deep. And it's so important if you can help people uh, to find a way to connect with loved ones. I have also assisted people who haven't had the tools um, to work with people who are dying and who are in those altered states and they feel so distant. And I remember working some years back with a man and uh, he, he was so sad. His, 
His, uh, his wife was dying, a young woman, she had cancer, she was not lucid in different altered states, and he felt so far from her. And I just helped him do something like that, following her nonverbal signals, not just talking about ordinary reality. And um, it, was very, it was very touching. And when, when she died, he just felt so intimate and close to her. And right before she died, she got a call. She was a Mexican woman living in the United States. She got a call from Mexico. Again, this idea of going home. And it was her best friend. And the whole family was around us. And I said, let's sing a love song from Mexico. And we sang a love song. And that's when she died. It's just so touching and beautiful. Um, so do check out uh, the books I mentioned to find out how to connect with people in these deep altered states. It's really important and moving. If you are working with, oh, and Ingrid's book. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. I forgot that, Vanessa. Thank you for mentioning Ingrid's book. Yes. Um, things to consider if you're working with people who have a terminal uh, illness or told they have a terminal illness who are, who are sick. Um, think about and live together as if everyone lives each day as if it were the last day. Help people to go over edges, personal edges as well as relationship and world edges. Obviously, what have we not said to each other? What do we want family members to know about this that we haven't spoken about? You might experience dying together. Why not? I know this is all the taboo stuff. It sounds weird. But if you have some kind of openness, uh, you know, talking about the weather after a while, it's not so interesting. But saying, let's, let's do something different. And I know it's irrational, but we want to be close to you, dear mom or granddad or whoever you are, we want to be close to you. Let's all imagine if we were to die together and then following our deepest states of mind and then how do we relate together? Can we find, and if we die, can we then ask ourselves what lives? What is the eternal part of each of us? And then you might together maybe make a song, use art and creativity, movement uh, helps people. Um, share together your deepest and more mystical thoughts about dreams and death. Um, engage in creative projects together. Um, something I know that many uh, parents uh, who are dying do, especially for children, maybe you've heard of this before. Oh, someone says to have a death party. That sounds perfect. Yes. Some parents do this thing where they make different videos to be shown at different points in their growing child's life. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but it's been so touching me to me. The video of your high school graduation, or when you get married, or if you were to land in jail, or all kinds of different things that might happen, if you're lost, if you're heartbroken. And it really helps the person who, who is dying have some kind of a purpose in life. Um, let's see. Um, I want to talk about uh, working now with grief and sudden death. Um, Nisha, are you present here today? Are you here? Would want to know if you're here. Okay, maybe not. Okay. Um, in all of the literature that I've read about death, and maybe you know too, or maybe you've also experienced that personally, is that sudden death seems to be the hardest for people. Very hard on family and friends because there are potential relationships, relationship things or experiences that haven't been shared or expressed, and this tends to compound the grief. One of the most difficult things for people is just simply to be with grief, to be with strong emotion. It's really hard because it's hard for most of us in everyday life. Most of us, or many of us, I should say, have a fix-it mentality. We want people to feel better, and we think they're going to feel better if they're not grieving or they're not crying, but yet that is exactly what people need to do. Just being able to sit with people and feel them 
so essential. I remember years back when my grandmother died, who I was very close with, and my granddad, they were married for many, many decades. And I, he was very stoic, a reserved man. And when she died, he cried a river. It was, we had never seen him like this. And, uh, and everyone would try to cheer him up in the family. Everyone would try to cheer him up and talk about everyday things. And I could tell he was just never there. And one time when I was visiting, I saw that whole scene going on. He was sitting in the couch and people trying to cheer him up and relate to him about everyday things. And I just went and I sat next to him and I held his warm hand and I just said, Grandpa, I'm here. I'm suffering too. I miss her so much. Let's just sit together. And I just sat with him on the couch and held his hand. I said, there's nothing you have to say. Let's just remember her in our own ways and feel whatever we feel. And it was such, I felt like I was protecting him from an army of consensus reality family who just wanted to, you know, good hearted, they wanted to make him feel better. But that's not how that happens. So being with grief and learning how to follow the different emotional experiences that come up. Next thing I wanna talk about is guilt because many family members feel guilt, particularly with sudden death. Um, maybe their last experience with the individual was negative in some way, or there were feelings that were never spoken. Um, some people also feel guilty because they felt that death was near in fact, they saw the signals. They might have seen dangerous or reckless behavior and they didn't say anything. And uh, I, I have, a, from my own experience, I remember in my early twenties, I was with a friend on a beach and she was so reckless and she came within an inch of smashing her head on a boulder on the beach. And the interesting thing about it was that she laughed about it. She was laughing and I was like, oh my goodness, this is, I said, Kim, this is your death. I was right in the middle of the beginning of my process work studies. I said, I was picking up the signals, but now I look at it. The laughter was also maybe her detachment about life and death because a half a year later, she died in a motorcycle wreck and smashed her head. But it was all there. It was all there early on. So guilt, we need to hear the feelings of guilt from our clients. We, let, we need to let the details unfold, but we also need to model compassion. And one of the most powerful things to do around that is to get into the dreaming mind of the person who has died. Um, for example, I recently worked with someone, it's easier to see in an example, I worked with a young man in his early 20s, and he lost a childhood friend in a car crash. And he felt very guilty that he didn't stop him. His friend was in trouble. He had money problems. He had drug issues. And he got in a car, and he just decided to drive east with no destination. And my client felt totally guilty that he didn't reach out to his friend. So what I had him do, and this is a powerful intervention, is I had him find, um, we did vector work, we would call this in process work. I had him, and you have to set this up for the person, especially because it's such an irrational thing to do. You have to say, I know this is a really weird thing to do. Um, and you're a, you're a pretty rational person. And I wanna just do something a little weird and irrational. Maybe it'll be helpful. You wanna try it, something like that. And then what you wanna do is have someone stand up and it's hard to do here but if you can stand up and slowly rotate 360 degrees sentiently rotate you might close your eyes and rotate and sense if there was to be a vector or a direction where we feel that dead person where would that be and encourage the person, just say, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a weird feeling thing, just whatever pops up. Quite honestly, everyone I have tried this with, it's not my idea, it's Arnie Mandel's idea, but everyone I have tried this with, 
it goes really easily. I think people are open, especially in desperate times to try anything. So I did this with this young man, and then I had him walk towards that vector and feel every, all the feelings he felt as he walked in that certain direction towards his friend who had died. And he had all kinds of feelings doing that. And then I said, and when you get to the end of it, I want you to slightly turn as if you were the dead friend and face me. And then at that moment, he switches and he is the dead friend. And I say, I want to talk to you, dead friend. Are you there? Tom, let's call him Tom. Tom, are you there? You're over there in the distance there. I want to talk to you. Encourage this young man to stay with the dreaming consciousness of what he imagines Tom to be. And then Tom says, the dead friend says, I am at peace. I ask, I ask as the client, I say, what am I going to do, Tom? I feel so guilty. Tom says, there was nothing you could do. I am at peace here. I am better here. This is a good place for me. Please do what is important for you in life. Don't wait and believe in yourself. That was the message from the dead friend. So this helps a lot around guilt because you can tell someone, don't feel guilty, don't feel guilty. And you can do that. And certainly I think modeling a compassionate attitude um, not about guilt is really important, but a no blame attitude. But if you can access the dreaming essence of the dead person, this really is relieving for people. Another thing you might do with guilt is guilt can become a motivator for folks to complete things now. Someone, for example, who feels guilty that they never expressed love. Well, let's do it now. Who else have you not expressed love to? Pick up the message in that. Pick up the learning that's in the person's death so they didn't die in vain. Is everyone clear around that? Mm. Thank you. Um, and then let's talk about the living legacy of the dead. With sudden death, especially young people, the sense is that a person died too soon. They had so much potential and unlived life and many people go on by taking the message of the dead further. What is the legacy that can be carried in their life? For example, many people will set up foundations for teens who commit suicide, for young people who've been bullied, um, uh, the Sandy Hook parents, parents whose kids died in the gun shooting in the state of Connecticut some years back. So what, what legacy does the dead person leave us? in maybe a social or collective way, but then also in a personal way. Is there something personal that they leave for us that we need to live? <clears throat> Another thing that is so important in the process of grieving at some point is to actually connect with the dead. And you can do that through vector work as, as I spoke about, but you can also do it um, asking people to feel in their own body. What is the deepest, where inside of their body would, this, would the dead live? And again, you have to say, I know it's a weird, irrational question, but I remember doing that with a child, an 11 year old whose mom died. And it was really touching. She said, yeah, mom's right here in my heart. And I said, yes. And we have to always remember to feel her. We have to hold her close. It's so important. So connecting to the spirit of the dead. Um, if you get close internally to the essence of the dead person, I think you miss them less. Everyone will have their own viewpoint on that. It's a subjective feeling. Of course, we miss our loved physically and relationally in a certain way. But if you can connect with the essence, I think it helps quite a bit. Another thing that you might want to process is completing a dialogue. Many need to have a conversation with the dead, not just hear a message. For example, I recently worked with a woman who lost her wife to suicide, and she felt guilty that the night before um, her wife needed her and she wasn't available. So she felt really guilty about that. 
Um, so we had a conversation with her and her dead wife, helping her to move back and forth between those positions. She needed to tell her wife why she wasn't present. And then she also realized distance in their relationship. It wasn't just that night, but it had been actually ongoing. And it was something that both of them had a hard time talking about. And in the conversation, the, the dead person could understand that, actually supported her to make changes in her life and to not just go along with situations that are distant, but to become more intimate with people and share herself more. And that was helpful to her. Um, let's see, I talked about already how the dead still grow. That's a crazy thing. If you were some people, sometimes abusive parents apologize. Um, interesting things happen when you can connect. Another thing to consider around the suddenness of death, and this is not something you will probably want to do immediately with a grieving person, um, but the living might consider at some point perhaps to pick up uh, what is the sudden thing? Is there something that is sudden, spontaneous, that needs to happen? Something uh, that really embodies that sudden energy? Um, is there a life change that the surviving person needs to make? Doing something really fast, using that energy somehow, the energy of the death itself, and using it for personal growth. Um, to mention suicide. Suicide's a really big process. Sorry, I'm speeding around of everybody, but I know we only have a short time together, so I'm hoping folks are able to follow me. I kind of want to give you a lot to think about, and, uh, and uh, this will at some point anyway be released on a recording so you can review it and think more about it. Um, but suicide, such a painful process, especially when it involves a young person all of the feelings of agony and grief and sadness and anger, all of that has to be valued. And again, those who remain often feel guilty. How did they not notice certain signals? Or maybe they did notice them, but they felt too powerless. They didn't know what to do or they felt hopeless. And in some way, and this is a big thing to consider, in some way, the tortured feeling of guilt is in some way a suicide. Do you get that? Torturing yourself in the moment, the one who survives. Oh, I'm so guilty. I didn't do this. That in and of itself, that kind of self-hurting is the suicide that's happening now in the moment. You follow that? Someone needs to say, no, let's stop that now. I want to save you now. Enough of that. Yeah. Another thing I want to mention about suicide is it also brings up basic ideas of life and death. Certainly the consensus reality view is, is, is awful. I mean, it's, it's such a painful topic. Um, but from other perspectives, I just want to open the door there that many people also come to accept it as a choice that their loved one made. In some ways, it might even have brought a certain kind of peace. And um, these are questions that I'm not, yet, uh, I'm not yet old enough to answer those questions, but I can contemplate them with you. I can think about them together. That somehow um, there is an understanding or a peace and it just brings up ideas of basic life and death. Um, but I feel the attitude of no blame and compassion is extremely important. Um, and also with suicide, another process at some point will be for the one who's grieving about that to get in touch with the one who has had enough in her home life. Where can't I take it? Where do I want to give up? Where can't I go on anymore? Where is this in us? That would be a way to pick up that process and learn something about ourselves and maybe even feel closer to the one who has died. Yeah. 
we can connect with the one inside of ourselves who has suicided, we will feel closer to the one who has actually, who has actually done that. Um, last thing I want to talk about, I think, is uh, death in the family system or death in systems. Um, for many people, death in a family or an organization leaves a large hole. For example, in organizations, a leader dies. Who will be the leader now? Who carries the vision of the organization? Who will be the grandparent? Who will be the protector? It's often a crisis moment for organizations and also families because it leaves an open hole, but it also leaves a tremendous opportunity for others to step into. Many organizations learn about their own leadership in those moments as other people come and step forward. Many families learn about parts of themselves. I remember a family I worked with, they were all so distant since the grandmother died, the matriarch had died. The one who was generous, who had the big dining room table, who brought everyone to the table. And without her, no one was picking up that role. So in that way, not only honoring grandma by thinking about her, but by letting her spirit move through the family. Can we all share the role of being the grandmother in some way? Also with families, um, uh, with, with parents, if one parent dies, the parent often feels compelled to be very strong for children. But in that way, you might think that you rob the children from role of being a comforter. Think about that. A parent also grieves and a parent can cry and ask for help and say they're having a hard time and suddenly you'll notice a small child will come and and pat your head and say it's okay daddy it's okay and that's important. We mustn't feel bad like oh my goodness our children are having to comfort us. We should feel great about that that our child is developing and they're able to be more of themselves and find the part of them also that can comfort others. It's a very touching thing actually. So the fluidity of shared roles. And, and I think the most, the biggest thing around uh, process work, well, I've said a bunch of stuff, but one of the big things is really helping people connect to more dreamland and essence level dimensions in death. And these come up in different ways. For example, if you, if you have a signal awareness, you'll often see um, a, the simple gesture of someone who's grieving. You'll see them maybe holding their head in their hands. Now, when you see someone holding their head in their hands, you see the head, right? That's the one who's suffering and who's really sad, but then, Whose hands are these? What are the hands doing? The hands, the hands that can hold. It's such a beautiful thing that I have hands to hold my head. Yes, it's comforting. And that these hands, if you unfold that and go more deeply into it, it's not just you as a person holding those hands, but you might even ask yourself, who are those hands connected to? It's something larger than me, something that's way outside of my person that is holding me. And th this is how people often connect more to spiritual traditions where they feel held by God or something or nature. And those big transpersonal experiences are always present, even with the suffering, even if it's just your bed that's holding you. Have you ever thought of that? You can become your bed. You can become the bed, the one that is holding your body. I know it's, it's hard to shape shift sometimes into these experiences, particularly when we're suffering and there's nothing like having that person who you miss so dearly next to you. But these are some tips and hopefully they're helpful to some of you. And um, if there are a couple questions, I'll answer a couple things before I sign off today. If someone has one, Feel free to ask it or type it in. Thanks for letting me share this stuff with you. I, I feel always very moved to talk about it. And more than any of my other free classes, I, was, I had a lot of buzz inside of me. 
because I think I was feeling so much also about the times. Um, oh, I'm glad people feel close and helpful. <clears throat> uh, you're welcome, everybody. Is there any other questions? A lot asks advice for healthcare providers um, while they are attending to people dying away from their families. Yes, hold the, hold the phone. Try to be really sensory grounded. The one on the phone maybe says, I want to hug you. Say, go ahead, hug them now. And then say to the one who's lying in bed dying, say, go ahead, feel the hug. So-and-so is hugging you now. Feel her arms around you. Don't just be relate locally, but help people to pick up and make um, bring the body into their imagination or experience right in the moment. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, oh, someone asks, dying compensate, a collective attitude that emphasizes life. You know, these are big questions, I know, life and death. It's something I like thinking a lot about. Um, oh, a cousin has COVID. Yeah, Sunith, I'm sorry to hear about that. Sending love, follow yourself, follow your deepest essence when you talk to them. Okay, folks, I think I'm gonna sign off and I appreciate you all being here today. And. Uh...